I want to welcome you all to tonight's lecture. It's a pretty good talk, and uh, what these guys have to say is, a, is an exciting part of uh, the Houston space ecosystem, and I hope you really enjoy it. Um, and I apologize once again for David not being able to be here. This is a unique. I think uh, uh, he's only missed one other one. Um, and also, this is also unique because we have a tag team, uh, which is, uh, that's also unusual. I don't know if we've ever had one. Uh, I didn't look to make sure we didn't have one, but I, I'm going to claim it's unique. And so uh, this is going to be a groundbreaking innovation, which is exactly what we're talking about. Uh, innovative introduction, innovative speakers, and innovative... Uh, format. So, so uh, welcome all of you to this lecture. Uh, tonight we have uh, our uh, Jacobs Engineering and Technical and Sciences Services team uh, Office of Commercial uh, Partnerships Technology and Innovation yeah. Office. Right up there. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's also written right here. <laughs> I, could have, I could have easily just looked right over here. But I thought it would be better if I stammered through it. <laughs> so, anyway, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first, or both of our, I'm going to talk about both of our speakers, and then uh, they'll take it away. So, the first speaker is Wobi Ofori. He has been a fixture in the uh, Houston Innovation Ecosystem uh, he got to start with the Houston Airport and uh, turned that into a super successful, successful joint venture. And uh, then once uh, he sort of had finished with that, the Houston ecosystem of uh, startups and innovation kind of called him to leave that venture and come over. And, and uh, so he began a um, process of advising all of the ecosystem as a uh, you know technology and innovation. Uh, entrepreneur, uh, trying to help other people sort of succeed on the path that he had succeeded on. And then uh, he formed his own little company, and uh, then I got a call from Jacobs, said, hey, come, why don't you come be a strategist for us? And they said, uh, because, you know, we, we bid this in a contract, and we, we really want it to be successful. So they said, hey, well, we come get us. Come, come join us. And Tim is the, uh, is the leader of the office. And he has a vast array of hardware development experience. He developed uh, life support systems and spacesuit systems and done a lot of work in the JSE ecosystem. And what we have here with these guys is sort of, we want old space talking to new space and really getting some success. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Wobi. And then after he finishes his part, he's going to turn it over to Tim. Uh, please help me, join me in. Wow, that was brilliant, man. That was brilliant. Um, I'm glad that I now know what I do. So uh, thank you very much for that. So, um, and thank you for everybody joining us online as well. So today, this is going to be a little bit different. Uh, consider it more of a briefing than a lecture. And it's actually two parts. So there is the part where we want to talk about this unique opportunity and resource available to Houston startups called the Commercial Partnerships Technology and Innovation Office, or CPTIO. So just you know, just staying consistent with the tradition of aerospace, continuing from traditional aerospace, even new aerospace. We've got to focus on the acronyms. And so <laughs> lots of acronyms there. However, um, before we go and talk about that specific opportunity and just introducing it to you so we look for the real purpose is just to get everybody familiar with what exactly it is that that's about Oops, excuse me this is a little bit slower than i am um, when i originally was talking to david about potentially speaking uh, he wanted me to come and talk about something i've spoken about before which is how did this particular epoch of the tech innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem come to be in Houston. I call it the renaissance. And so I said, okay, you know, I'll do that. We're thinking we'll do it next year. But um, 
when we said we wanted to also introduce the CPTIO, he had the idea of could we put those two things together uh, for the Renaissance part and how it fits in with the larger Houston innovation entrepreneurship, tech entrepreneurship, ecosystem development being the backdrop. And I said, okay, I will try, but it's going to be a challenge because there are multiple layers to this. There's what's happened in the country and then slash the world. There's how Houston factors into that. And then behind that is how commercial aerospace is now rising up within it. So that is my intention, and I'm going to go very quickly. And so my intention is to hit the wave tops, and hopefully what you guys come away with in this preview or this backdrop to when we get to talking about the CPTIO, and I hand it over to Tim, is that you have a little bit better of an understanding or hopefully a little bit of a framework of, oh, where did that come from? Oh, I had no idea that this is where those things happen within time. So my hope is that every one of you will learn something new about that which you are currently within right now. Uh, so let's get going. So uh, Houston's tech ecosystem is an innovation constellation. So as opposed to other tech ecosystems, particularly in, on the coasts, where they are formed around areas of geographic concentration, Houston's not like that. Houston is the model of urban sprawl, so everything is exploded outward. But that is actually a feature, not a flaw. If we can connect the various pieces within the, the constellation, or excuse me, various pieces within the ecosystem into a constellation, almost like a neural network, where we are able to create something that is greater than the sum of its parts. And so in the context of the commercial aerospace ecosystem, there is a hub for that down south. Now, here, OK, it's moving a little bit slower than I am again. So this is what our ecosystem looks like, that constellation. And so you see the, uh, the 610 is in the middle, and then you've got the, the 8, and then the uh, Grand Parkway out there. And this is basically identifying right now six hubs, but there are a couple of more. Uh, with the tech, uh, sorry, the aerospace tech hub, and I'm specifically using the word tech with aerospace hub, being down there in the lower right-hand corner to the southwest. However, all of these other things that are around it, what you see in the light blue, are the areas of influence that are overlapping that, again, are creating a very virtually dense ecosystem, even if they're spread out over a very large area. So the first thing to understand is that Houston has been in the tech innovation space for a long time. Let us go to the beginning. So in the early days where the foundation was laid, there were a number of things I want to hit on just again to reinforce the point that We've been in this for a little while. So first, we have the Kennedy's, Kennedy's Be Bold speech. We know that here, Rice, 1962. Uh, we have Apollo 11, 1969, Apollo 13, 1970. The formation of our founding of Compact Computer uh, was night here in Houston, 1982. Genesis Park, Genesis Park is a private equity firm um, that was uh, founded and has had a lot to do with supporting some of the backbone of early technology uh, incubation and development as well as investment uh, founded by uh, Paul Hobby in 1999. The Houston Technology Center was founded in, also in 1999 and one of the protégés of Paul Hobby, Blair Guru, was there in the Houston Technology Center helping get that going. You'll notice two down Mercury Fund. Blair then went on to found Mercury Fund. And Mercury Fund is currently Houston's largest by assets under management uh, uh, venture capital fund, or venture capital firm, I should say. Uh, Rice Alliance, now Rice Alliance has been around for a long time. Rice Alliance is still around, founded in 2000. 2000. Red House, Red House is actually an angel investors, angel investors in technology, uh, founded in 2011, NanoRacks, uh, uh, space technology company, 2009, Intuitive Machines was founded in 2013, TMCI, that's uh, Texas Medical Center's uh, Innovation Institute, was founded in 2014, Houston Mechatronics, which was founded by Nick Radford and a group of engineers that left NASA uh, to found a company that does 
uh, underwater intelligent robotic systems, autonomous robotic systems. Uh, that was founded in 2014. They are now Nauticus Robotics. The Houston Spaceport was licensed in 2015. Station Houston, arguably uh, Houston's first modern era, era incubator, was founded in 2016. And Axiom Space was also founded in 2016. So then we had what I call the Renaissance. That is the period that we currently in now, but I'm breaking it up into several parts. So the first wave from 2017 to 2020. So in 2017, there was something called the Accenture Report. Now, how, what led up to this report that Accenture put out was, at that point, Houston's economy was not very diverse. So as you know, we are the energy capital of the world, or actually, especially in the context of that period of time, the oil and gas capital of the world. So our, much of our base was concentrated in oil and gas. Actually, what's interesting is that a lot of people didn't know that right around that time, our greatest employer, though, was not in oil and gas. Our greatest employer was Continental Airlines. Uh, until they left and moved their headquarters to Chicago, which caused the big kerfuffle. So now there was a lot of concern, though, because right around this time, actually in 2016, I believe, Detroit declared bankruptcy. Now, this was a major US city who had gone bankrupt, and that caused a lot of people here to be concerned. Hey, if you have a major US city who is reliant on a single industry that went bankrupt, could that happen here? Now, most people thought, no, 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 because the oil and gas, we're always going to need oil and gas. Nobody's, that's never going to happen. But people started thinking about it, and particularly Mayor Sylvester Turner started thinking about it to form the, the mayor's uh, task force on innovation. That task force then went and tasked Accenture to create a report on how do you create a modern innovation ecosystem. See, because Houston is a mature business ecosystem. And as a mature business ecosystem that has been built on what I call the economy of the dead dinosaurs, that was a 20th century model coming out of the industrial era. However, now moving into the information age, the idea was, well, how do we go and transform our economy to be resilient in the 21st century? So Accenture created a report. Now, this report was meant to be a framework for what it would take to create a innovation ecosystem here in Houston. However, it wound up being interpreted as a playbook. And so there are 10 recommendations within the report. And basically what happened is that you know city leaders and others here decided they were going to go down the list one by one and let's go and put these things into play. Now, as tends to happen, the political focus on economic development tends to be focused or centered around jobs. So jobs creation is usually the big driver of how can we go and get this thing going. And so there was a desire to want to jumpstart this as quickly as possible. So let's go and focus on this one. Number two, recruit a large anchor high tech firm. Oh, it so happened that there was one who was making a lot of noise at that time called Amazon. And Amazon started this thing. They called it HQ2. And this was a competitive bidding process to see where their second headquarters would be located. Oh man, this was a crazy period of time. So in the end, 238, I believe, different areas, municipalities across uh, US, Mexico, and I think a couple in Canada went and applied to see if we could get or you can get Amazon's second headquarters. What came along with that prize? Amazon promised 50,000 jobs that would come along with that instantly. So that was going to be an instant win for anybody who wanted an ecosystem in a box. Now, while this was going on, Houston Exponential was formed. So Houston Exponential was formed uh, from the Mayor's Task Force and Innovation, was, was combined with a, um, with a GHP Innovation Corridor Committee, I think is what it was called. And they went and combined that into something called Houston Exponential, which essentially was a economic development organization that was focused almost exclusively on promoting tech entrepreneurship and innovation. At the same time, in 2017, the Canon was formed. And the Canon is also another tech hub in the modern way, when I say modern way, in the kind of Silicon Valley model of tech hubs. Well, things didn't work out. 2018, we had what was called the Amazon snub. 
And so uh, Amazon narrowed down that list of over 200 and or so candidates to a list of 20. Now, in Texas, there are four cities that are known as the Texaplex. Now, so those are not familiar. That would be Houston, San Antonio, Austin, and Dallas. Well, of those four, one of them decided to not bid. They were smart, San Antonio. The other three, Houston, Dallas, and Tex uh, Houston, Dallas, and Austin all bid. Dallas and Austin went to the second round. Houston did not. Now, Houston, we are the biggest of the Texaplex cities. We are the fourth largest city in the nation. We like to brag about how big and bad we are. But Amazon said, no, thank you. And that hurt some people's feelings. And so some people felt some kind of way about this. I mean, there were articles being published about wake up call and all sorts of other things were being said. And Pittsburgh made the cut. How could this be that Houston <laughs> didn't make the cut? And so there was this resolution. And what was great about Amazon rejecting us was that if Amazon didn't reject us, we probably wouldn't be here now. I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now because that rejection became the catalyst for us to say, it's time to build. We can do this. So we have the Amazon snub here in 2018. And then after that, we went down that essential list. And then HX Venture Fund was launched. And so HX Venture Fund is a fund of funds. So this is a, this is a fund that invests in other venture capital funds with the idea, and all of the venture capital funds that I invest in are outside of Houston. Uh, this, this may seem strange, but the whole idea is that by investing in funds outside of Houston and giving those funds an opportunity to look at the opportunities in Houston, this would better bring in fresh capital and fresh opportunities to combine with capital, opportunities growing in Houston, and see the magic happening. So HX Venture Fund was, was launched. Impact Hub, which is another incubator focused on impact, uh, uh, impact ventures, was formed. And WeWork uh, put in one of their first uh, Houston locations in 2018. Then we have 2019, and things are taking off. So we wind up with 30 SDOs, startup development organizations, depending upon how you want to count it. But let's call it 30. In um, 2019, we have three new WeWorks. We've got two new, uh, well, actually, it's one more Canon location, the downtown launch pad, which uh, put together a number of these things in one building. And then Space Fund, uh, which is a dedicated uh, venture capital fund for funding commercial aerospace launches in Houston as a micro fund in 2019. Now, this this uh, chart here is meant to show you how things grew. So from 2005 to 2013, in that period of time, there were only three startup development organizations, Fannin Innovation, Alice Spark, and Red Labs. Now, again, some might contend to that, um, say, well, how come um, Rice Alliance is not there? Rice Alliance actually predated this. Uh, so Rice Alliance is back to 2000. So there actually were a couple of more. But we have three new ones in that entire period of time, eight years. In 2014, six come on. So we, we go from three to six. So 2014, we add three. 2015, we add two more. These are both at TMC. 2016, we add two more. 17, two more. Uh, 18, two more. By 19, we add 15 more. And so we had an explosion of startup development organizations in the Renaissance. Now we're really cooking with gas by the time we get to 2019. Now, of course, then there's the thing named after 19, COVID-19. And COVID-19 really comes on the scene in the first quarter, as you all remember, March of 2020. So Halliburton Labs also launched in 2020, which is uh, Halliburton's uh, innovation and, incub and startup incubation effort. Uh, and the first Houston unicorn, uh, High Radius, which is a software company, uh, came, well, they were around, but they were declared a unicorn in 2020. And for those who are not familiar, a unicorn is a privately held company and most of the time, this, this was in the context of tech companies, a privately held tech company that has a valuation in the private markets of over $1 billion. 
And so the ION was also meant to come online, but was delayed. And Greentown Labs was meant to come online, was delayed. Now, I said all this was going to be very fast. I can do an entire talk on each one of these uh, and really unwrap, uh, unwrap or go do a deep dive into their impact, but we're not going to do that today. So there became a question. When COVID-19 hit, we're in 2020, first half of 2020, everybody's talking about the world's falling apart. Everybody's trying to figure out what the quote unquote new normal is. And so there's a lot of question as to, well, will we achieve escape velocity? Because we had a good launch, but now we've had a, you know, some sort of anomalous situation. Are we still going to achieve escape velocity? Well, as it turns out, things went very differently than we would have thought. And this came into what I call the waitlist period. So the waitlist period was between the second half of 2020 and all of 2021. And everything stopped making sense. <laughs> Gravity seemed to have turned off for a lot of people, and especially in venture. All of a sudden, we have explosive growth. Now, it is not by accident. It was by policy. Because of the policy decisions by the uh, Fed and the Treasury to flood the market with money, so there was a lot of money being pumped in, as you know, a lot of stimulus, and to lower interest rates as much as possible to try to prop up the economy. This created an anomalous, perfect environment for this kind of thing to happen, wherein all of a sudden there was so much money sloshing around in the economy, trying to find places to go, that investors at the top of the investment value chain, you know, institutional investors, now found themselves, hey, we're, we have all this money. Let's find out, figure out ways to deploy it in ways that we might not have done before. So they increased their allocations to venture capital, not necessarily by percentages, but they just had so much more money that they were able to dump so much more money into venture capital. Venture capital then is saying, we've got so much more money that we're going to go and put it into a lot of startups so that we can raise our next round. And you wound up having very interesting things because the average time that it took for a fund to go for, for a venture capital firm to go from one fund to deploy the capital and then come into another fund, and usually there was overlap in deploying the capital between, before they raised another fund, was about three years. During this period of time, it shrank to one year. So there was a high amount of cycling of capital. Now, you'll notice on this, this 58% growth in global mergers and acquisitions assets, exits, excuse me, with startups. SPACs, um, special, special purpose uh, acquisition companies, became the soup du jour. These were things that was a very, very obscure, um, vehicle for bringing companies public that was from back in the heyday of, uh, of private equity barons. And next thing you know, this became very, very popular because it allowed some of these companies to dictate their terms going public. And next thing you know, the median exit value for a SPAC company going public was $1.6 billion. Um, FinTech was one of the big themes at that time. Now, a lot in venture happens thematically. So at that time, we actually went through three major themes. So FinTech was one of the major themes. We also went through a major theme with bio because there were two startups who kind of helped save the world, BioNTech and Moderna. And so now, all of a sudden, everybody was really interested in anything that had the acronym RMNA. And so they were making it rain for if it had protein in it or had those words. So uh, we also had the invasion of what are called non-traditional investors. So these were not venture capital firms, but rather asset managers who had tremendous amounts of money who came in and said, you know what? Venture capital looks like it's producing a lot of money, a lot of return. We're going to start dumping money there. So people like Tiger, uh, Tiger Global, SoftBank, Co2, they came in and started competing with venture capitalists, throwing more money out there. Masoshi San, the founder and head of SoftBank, actually coined the term weaponization of capital during this time. And so Silicon Valley grew to uh, have uh, startups 
that had a collective value of about one and a, one uh, hundred and five billion dollars. Now, at that same period of time, for us, we had hit in Houston a record, just over two two point two billion dollars in funding, most of which actually went to only five companies. We'll get to that in a second. So here now, 69% year-on-year increase in unicorns. We have um, $621 billion in one year is given in venture capital. Well, uh, this is a little chart just again showing that, how, that graph of how venture capital funding in Houston took off. And again, all of a sudden, we have a little over $2, $2 billion. There are, again, five companies that mostly split the lion's share of that. Also, in 2021, we had a couple of interesting things. Now, a mega round in venture capital is a round that um, wherein a company raises more than $100 million. It's an arbitrary figure. But uh, that's what's generally known as a mega round. Axiom Space had a mega round of $130 million in 2021. And Solugen. Um, had a mega round of $357 million in 2021. But you also had other things. Greentown Labs finally did open in 2021. East End Maker Hub opened in 2021. And the Ion had a soft opening. Now, these three, East End, the Ion and Greentown Labs are in the same cluster. But East End Maker Hub is another one of those clusters that we saw in that constellation. So 2021 is turning out to be a fairly good year. 2021 also sees the Intuitive Machines come in as the first spaceport anchor tenant. The Houston Spaceport Development Corporation is formed. Now, remember, the spaceport actually was authorized uh, six years before this, but the Houston Spaceport Corporation was formed in 2021. And Venus Aerospace. Venus Aerospace uh, is a startup that is working on hypersonic propulsion systems and uh, hypersonic aircraft. They actually moved from California, where the two founders were actually working for uh, Virgin Galactic, actually both Virgin Galactic and Virgin Orbit, and then came to Texas because they heard the hot things were happening here. And they came here, moved here with just $3 million of seed money at the time, uh, and are just on the other side of the uh, runway from the spaceport, but they're at Ellington. And then the next part of the Renaissance is where I say we had a fairy tale ending. And so 2022, gravity turned back on. And venture collapsed. Valuations collapsed. Everything went into the trash. Um, and so even though all of that bad news, venture capital you know, was drying up. People were finding it very difficult to raise. Venture capital funds were finding it very, capital, very difficult to raise. There still was momentum in hard tech in Houston. And so Fervor Energy raised the mega round in 2022 of $138 million. Even in that environment, Syzygy Plasmonics, uh, $76 million. Solugen, again, another $200 million mega round. So 2022 also had a couple of other notable things happen that were on the positive side. Collins Aerospace uh, opening their facility at the spaceport. AX1, uh, Axiom's uh, first all civilian, um, all -civilian uh, astronaut uh, mission is in 2022. I said 2021 earlier. 2022, Venus raises $20 million in that year. And the Jets to CPTIO is created, which we'll talk about more in just a minute. 2022 also saw Nauticus Robotics. Remember, we talked about Houston Mechatronics before. Nauticus Robotics goes debuts public on a NASDAQ. And this little, uh, this little advisory firm called Works also starts in 2022. So now we are in what I call the second wave. And in the second wave, we are now in a place where a lot of what were propelling the first wave through various hype cycles have dissipated. And now we have to see whether or not we're going to be able to continue the progress to achieve escape velocity. And there are some positive indicators. So Axiom Space, again, another mega round for them. And AX3 launch. We have uh, Intuitive Machines makes its NASDAQ debut. So now we have two companies that went through that whole cycle of venture funding and then crossed the line and went to the public markets. Uh, JSC announces AFP for Exploration Park. And then we've got the formation of the Texas Space Commission, uh, TARSEC, and the and the uh, Space Exploration and Aeronautics Research Fund, all part of a, uh, if you will, a package of resources being now promoted or created by the state of Texas to promote 
commercial aerospace in Texas competitively with places like Florida and Huntsville, Alabama, or Alabama Virginia, Colorado, et cetera. So a lot of positive things uh, on the horizon. Now quickly, I'm going to characterize the how the commercial uh, aerospace ecosystem is organized. I'm going to give you a little framework for how to think about this, and then I'm going to turn it over to Tim. And so uh, forgive me for the blurriness. This was a, a PDF conversion issue. But I look at it as a stratified, multi-stakeholder ecosystem. And so again, this is looking at the commercial aerospace ecosystem as a component of tech. And so this is one of my posits. Aerospace is tech. The traditional aerospace industry is not and does not see itself as tech. Uh, because it is modeled mostly after the government, because it was a single market with two basic customers, NASA and the DOD, if you just take the DOD as one big customer. Commercial aerospace, because it was formed, or a lot of the founders were from the tech industry, it's taken on a very different business models and very different uh, cultures. Now, NASA made the pivot to start to found or to uh, to seed the creation of new markets by instead of saying we want to be the market and the market maker or we want to be the customer, rather we want to help to promote the creation of a market and we want to be a customer. And so this is a big shift, um, a big shift, but a very positive shift because it's opening up markets that haven't existed before and giving the opportunity to actually create a true space economy in which I define as an economic, where economic value is being exchanged between assets in space to ones who receive the value for the, the value that those assets create also in space, as opposed to on the ground. So there are five tiers. Tier five up top are the large prime contractors. Down below are the rapidly scaling startups. Tier three would be early stage startups with TRL development funding traction. Tier two would be pre-seed and seed stage startups, independent and university startups that could include you know, rice, maybe some coming out of here. And then tier one would be individual innovators, builders, and budding entrepreneurs. Let's take a look at those real quick. Tier five, here are examples of tier five. So Primes, Jacobs, Boeing, Collins, uh, Lockheed Martin, KBR. What do they contribute to an ecosystem? Well, first, their potential for near to midterm economic impact for these guys is high. Why is that? Because they already have very large job creation engines. So that's able to produce an economic impact very quickly. So if you want to, if you're again on the political side and you want to say we made a big difference in creating a new you know, space economy, you bring in a Collins, right? That's what's done. So great, we got a Collins, now we've got you know, a few hundred or a thousand jobs, that's great. You don't bring in a startup because that's just a few, right? Um, and then potential long-term uh, economic impact is moderate. Why is it moderate? Because they grow slowly. So they're already big, so they're, they're gonna grow slowly. Market value, the, uh, sorry, marketing value, and what I mean by that is a marketing value, how do these, the presence of these players contribute to marketing the ecosystem. It's also moderate. So if you have these players in the ecosystem, it's good, people recognize those names, but it's moderate because the new players in space and those new customers who want to, uh, who would be identifying with the tech side, they would see those old guys as, well, okay, we see you, but we're not sure if you know, we can do business with you. And they too are having trouble figuring out how to do business with non-government uh, customers, which they do in some cases, but usually, again, those are very, very well-established pathways. Satellites, yeah, you know how to do that. Airplanes, you know how to do that. Uh, missile systems, we know how to do that. But you know, some other applications that are now being conceived, those are going to be a little harder. Leadership and contribution to ecosystem energy, very low or none. And the reason is, is because they are mature and they have their own thing going and they're not looking out, out up and out for anybody else. Next, tier four rapidly scaling startups. Examples of those are Nanorax, and Voyager, who's uh, now owned by Voyager Space, Intuitive Machines, Axiom Space. So um, these companies 
at tier four, they're rapidly, they're still, I would consider them rapidly scaling startups. Their near term uh, economic impact is moderate because they are still actually uh, particularly, I think Axiom still, but definitely intuitive is still a small business, not going to be for much longer, but still a small business. So they're not creating that many jobs, but they do have higher long term economic impact because they're going to grow more into it. Marketing value is high, though. So if you have SpaceX around, you have Blue Origin around, I would say, you know, Axiom Intuitive is a lot of noise, is a lot of buzz, a lot of positive press, a lot of excitement around these companies. So that definitely contributes to the marketing value of the ecosystems where, it, where they're established. Leadership and contribution to the ecosystem uh, and contribution, excuse me, the ecosystem energy is relatively low, low to moderate. And the reason being, they're really busy. So they don't have, usually have a lot of opportunity to get out and do this. Intuitive happens to put that as a priority, which is why I'm in the, uh, that's why I'm in this gear and I'm here doing this. Um, tier three, uh, early stage startups with TRL development and funding traction. Now, if you notice, these are actually specific examples for this ecosystem. In, in other words, um, those are all the tier fours. And this is the only tier three. And tier three would be early stage startups with TRL development and funding traction. And that's Venus right now. Uh, Venus is the perfect model, though, for how you actually can gain the most from previous experience when developing a startup ecosystem. So you take two founders who came from another successful, well, successful, had some traction, startup, and then go and start their own startup. And that's usually the best way of kickstarting this positive and virtuous cycle of building up an ecosystem. Um, for these guys or folks at this tier, again, low to moderate in terms of their near term, near to midterm economic impact because they're still very small, moderate to high in terms of long, long term because they have a lot of potential to grow and create more jobs. Marketing value is very high because they're very exciting and they're, again, they're, they're on the upswing and have a lot of energy. Leadership and contribution to the ecosystem is high. And it's high on with these guys versus the tier fours because these guys actually are a little bit closer to the ground. And so because they're a little bit closer to where the rest of the, the, the uh, bedrock of, the, uh, of an ecosystem is, which is tier one, tier two, people still can look at them and relate to them as they're near. I can become like Venus in another year or another two. Let's talk about that foundation, uh, the, the bedrock. The bedrock are tier one and tier two. Tier two are the pre-seed and seed state startups. These are very, very early stage. And I consider them the bedrock, even though they don't positively contribute to the ecosystem. They draw from the ecosystem. And so when, I, when we look at near-term uh, economic impact, it's negligible because they usually don't have very many people employed. They're not, again, putting out economic value into the ecosystem. Their long-term economic impact is low because their survival rate's relatively low. Um, their marketing value is moderate in aggregate. So when you get a lot together at one of these innovation hubs, whether it's a Canon or the Ion, now you feel the energy in aggregate. But individually, they don't really contribute a lot of energy. Um, and the other thing about these guys in tier one who are, who are um, individuals, so the individual innovators and builders and on, budding entrepreneurs, is that although they are the heart of any ecosystem and they have a lot of energy in aggregate, that energy tends to dissipate quickly if it's not directed and organized, which is where SDOs come in. So start development organizations, innovation hubs, that's their purpose, is to try to harness this energy and by harnessing that energy, by the way, one of the greatest values of this tier is talent. And it's talent that doesn't necessarily come from the usual places. So this would be, this would be tech people, engineers, what have you, people who could solve problems, who say, hey, I think what you're doing is cool. Yeah, I can solve a problem. And they go and work on that, even though they may not have had a history prior of working in that specific industry. And so that's one of the benefits of the commercial aerospace industry as it's emerging, that you can have people coming from other places who are able to demonstrate the capabilities to solve those problems 
but may not have the history that the traditional aerospace may have said, well, you have to have this, this provenance and pedigree in order to serve our purposes. So this side, this, this tier is, is really where a lot of your talent is gonna come from. And it's what is going to make your ecosystem, and specifically this one, attractive to the tier threes, who then become the tier fours, and one day will become the tier fives. So that is a very quick and high level overview of how did we get here, and then how do we characterize what is currently in the ecosystem. And now I am going to turn it over to Tim to talk about specifically the JETS uh, CPTIO opportunity that is unique to our ecosystem that we are uh, now making available and on offer and want to let everybody know about. Tim? All right, thank you, Wobi. It's always very enlightening to, uh, to hear your overview of the tech ecosystem, and I think it really provides a really good context um, into what we're trying to do at the CPTIO. Um, so what I'll do is I'll give an overview of, of Jacobs and our, our contract with the Johnson Space Center. It's the JSC Engineering Technology and Science contract. So we love acronyms so much that it's actually an acronym within an acronym. <laughs> and then that'll give you some additional context in terms of the office that I manage. So I manage our commercial partnerships, technology innovation office, again, CPTIO. I think later on I'll maybe give you a pop quiz if you can remember all the acronyms that we, that we say. So on our contract, we, um, we serve primarily at the Johnson Space Center, the engineering directorate, as well as the Ashton Materials Research and Exploration Science Division. And so through our support, um, we are involved with many of different, many of the different NASA programs and missions. So that includes Artemis, that you may be familiar with, on how we're gonna go back to the moon and eventually onto Mars. So we've got people that work on the, the Orion vehicle, which is a capsule that's going to take us back to lunar orbit, um, as well as Gateway, which is going to be the new station around, around the moon, as well as what we're going to eventually have when we go to have lunar surface operations. And so we also support the program, what's called uh, EHP, which is the Extravehicular Air um, Activity Human Service Mobility Program. Try to fit that into the acronym if you can. Um, so things like the spacesuits, um, some rovers, and then uh, there's also, um, again, some Mars surface things I'll talk about um, in a minute here. We're also involved still with ongoing operations at the International Space Station, also includes commercial cargo, commercial crew, and of course the astronaut materials research that I mentioned earlier. So a lot of different things that, that we're involved in. So I'll go into a little bit more detail into some of the different projects that we work on um, through our contract. So starting on the bottom left over here, um, so back when NASA was developing the new spacesuits, that was the XCMU, another acronym, the Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Unit. Um, our folks were supporting NASA and JSC in development of that. That included, uh, just to the right of it, what was called the Portable Life Support System. So that provided all of the, you know, the consumables you needed within the spacesuit. And so that's basically the, the little backpack you see right on the, um, on the spacesuit there. And then in support of that work too, if you look above the, the XUMU there, um, another acronym, SURFI, Spacesuit Evaporation Rejection Flight Experiment. That was um, an activity where they were testing or looking at evaluating a component within the portable life support system, particularly the thermal control loop. Um, so that was a new approach, a new technology that was being incorporated at the time, and they wanted to basically look at that at a more flight-like environment. So that was an experiment flown on ISS, was up there for about two years, and then came back down, um, learned from it, looked at the data to, you know, to get a lot of lessons learned in a more flight-like environment. Um, so that was a really good effort there. Some other activities, there's a system engineering simulator. That is a, a multi-simulation system where we can evaluate um, different vehicles like the Orion, like the International Space Station. We can evaluate things to where we make changes to existing vehicles, or perhaps you know, we take an existing vehicle and see how it may interface, integrate with new vehicle systems in our development. So a lot of good capabilities there. Um, in terms of other hardware here, moving over to the right, um, there's two carbon dioxide removers that were for the Orion vehicle. The top one is the Orion Amin swing beds. The way, the way those work is that they're exposed to vacuum, so that helps remove and have that regenerative feature in terms of remo removing humidity and carbon dioxide from the vehicle. 
And so since that needs a vacuum to, to be able to function regenerate, then when the Orion vehicle comes back and it lands, certainly you're not in the vacuum environment anymore. So the bottom one there was called the post-landing lithium hydroxide CO2 remover. Um, that was another capability for when, when the crew is um, being, when they land in, you know, in the ocean and they're waiting to be picked up, that, that provides that capability. Another really cool project that we've been involved in is known as Japia. So that is there in the center, the crew health and performance exploration analog. That is the Mars simulation analog. So it's, it's basically used to simulate um, what would be a Mars a surface, uh, Mars surface mission. Um, it's a year long um, activity. So there are four uh, people in there right now at the Johnson Space Center going through that. They recently reached, I think it was a few weeks ago, 100 days. Um, so that was, a, that was a major milestone. And what's really cool about this too, that that, um, that facility that you see there, there that's kind of brownish orange, that was a, in conjunction or an effort with ICON. So that is a 3D printed housing that um, you know, we helped with, J, or the JSC uh, partnered with, with that company out of Austin, and you know, our people helped um, with that activity as well. Um, some other things here, you know, you know with payloads, uh, there's a crew quarter, so we work with some docking systems, lunar tool development, um, a portable wireless camera, which was a, a wireless camera used on the outside of ISS, using the existing wireless system so the crew could see things going on outside the, the vehicle. And then one major um, activity that we've been supporting that's, that's kind of wrapping up is the Viper Lunar Rover. That is a, um, stands for the, let's see if I can get this, Volatile Investigating um, Polar Exploration Rover. Um, I think I remember that. So that, that is basically going to be a prospecting for, for water and other resources on the surface of the moon. So this is a lot of different engineering projects that we support. Just a really quick overview, but um, I think it's really cool things that, that we get that our contract gets to work on with, with JSC and NASA. But not only do we do and support different engineering projects, that on our contract we uh, we help uh, operate and run the different testing facilities that are on site at the Johnson Space Center. So we have uh, some examples here on the bottom left. Our folks are involved with the space environment simulation chambers. Um, structural testing labs, uh, material evaluation lab, um, going down at the bottom, vibration testing. So, right, you're trying to mimic some of those space flight environments when you're certifying your different hardware that's going on these different vehicles. Um, there's a really cool uh, uh, facility called ESTA, Energy Systems Test Area. So, they do a lot of cool things like propulsion, in situ resource utilization, power, pyrotechnics, and battery testing. And then moving up, uh, there's, a, there's an EMI, electromagnetic interference and capability testing. So for different avionics and electronics, you know, we want to make sure everything are compatible with all the different requirements. Then on the top right there, there's a radiant heat test facility. Um, that's basically um, helping test and simulate um, the environment on reentry, right, when those high temperatures are being exposed to vehicles. So I've had a number of um, you know, commercial partners come in and test their vehicles there back in the shuttle days. Um, the leading edge of the shuttle wing was being tested in the radiant heat test facility. And then, of course, on the bottom right there, you see the big uh, thermal vacuum chamber A. And so for context, you can see at the very bottom right the two folks standing there and then the, the chamber when they do you know, vehicle level testing and some other things. There's a picture later on where you can see when the James Webb telescope was at JAC that's right next to it. Um, so it's always amazing to see that, that test chamber there if you get a chance. So, um, and then the other thing I mentioned about the astronaut materials curation and research, uh, our folks are also involved with that. I'll point out here over there in the middle, if you've been following some of the news more lately, on the uh, Cyrus Rex, the sample that came back from the asteroid Bennu a few weeks ago. Um, our people were very heavily involved in that activity as well. Um, there was a lot of preparation, a lot of thinking, a lot of practicing, going through the motions to make sure when that sample returned, that everything was done just right because we didn't want to mess anything up. Um, in fact, one of the things that's really interesting about that, there was a very, there was a clean room built just to handle that sample. And we're very happy to say that everything couldn't have gone more perfect. It was a very successful activity. And, and our folks will continue to support that and do their research on that, on that sample. So it's a really, really cool thing I like to talk about uh, on that one. So other areas in exploration science, so, you know, suit and tool testing for Artemis and the neutral buoyancy labs, right? The NBL is the, the big swimming pool where all the astronauts train. Um, some EVA tools over in the JSC Rock Garden, some of the development that goes on with that. 
Um, some folks will go out into some remote locations like Iceland to, to do some evaluations, um, you know, underwater testing. And then over there on the right is Argos. So if any of you have been to uh, Space Center Houston and taken the tram tour and you go see the space, you have a mock-up facility, and you go through that catwalk on the second floor and see the different, um, the different uh, mock-ups, then the Argos is there. That's a gravity offload system that can mimic like the lunar, you know, 16 g lunar gravity uh, where, you know, training can go. And our folks have been involved in the next gen or, or the third generation of that, um, of that system. Um, it's, it's, it's looking pretty good at constructing. It's, it's bigger, it covers more area. Um, so I'm going to try to make a time to go over there when that's up and ready to go see. So when you sum it up, right, we have a lot of different um, you know, engineering and test capabilities that span project management, vehicle and hardware testing, um, space environment testing for software systems, uh, system engineering and also manufacturing capabilities, both from a manufacturing and electrical perspective. So we do a lot of different things in support of NASA's missions and the programs. Um, and you know, it spans, like I said, a wide range of capabilities. So hopefully that, you know, that's a very high level. We have a lot of things going on on our contract, of course, supporting many of the different uh, missions and programs that NASA has going on. But hopefully that gives you some context and perspective because I want to introduce to you um, the CPTIO office. And we do um, a number of different things, but what we want to talk about here today is an area of what we call partnership and technology incubation. And that's where um, we're helping JSC and in, in what we can probably break down into to three different areas. Um, the first one is what we'll talk about is space industry growth. And so we'll be touched on, you know, this emerging commercial space ecosystem that we're seeing, this kind of this new space. And NASA and JSC are very much um, want to support and see that, that ecosystem develop. So we're looking at ways on how we can capitalize on that um, and particularly help channel some of that growth locally here in the Houston area, as well as just you know, the, the state of Texas overall. And some, some ways that we are being involved in through that is um, anytime there's, you know, strategy sessions that can go on or how we can help contribute to that strategy, we'll participate. So uh, I guess it was maybe a month or so, a couple of months ago, there was different industry leaders that came and um, participated in a strategy session that was hosted by, or invited by JSC and hosted by Deloitte, and um, we participated in that. I think Wobi uh, briefly mentioned about the Texas Space Commission. Um, so when there were some inputs going to that, we were, we were part of providing some, some feedback into what that may look like, and as well as seeing if there's potential opportunities for serving on either a board or advisory role um, as that commission gets stood up. Of course, in terms of growing the space industry growth, we're very interested in workforce development. I mean, continuously, we can have a continuous pipeline of, of talent come in, so we'll engage different educational institutions, including trade schools like the San Jacinto College. Uh, we provide inputs into their curriculum and their, their different technician training programs that they have there. The second thing here are, can be summarized into towards um, connections and partnerships. So we're looking to see if we can um, help NASA be a conduit of knowledge transfer, um, you know, between, between NASA and the rest of the community. That could include nonprofits, economic organizations, startup development organizations, uh, to be that, that knowledge transfer. We can further talk about that being in terms of either technology infusion into NASA, if we identify new things that can help serve NASA's missions and programs, but also from, a, from an outfusion perspective, um, basically helping out from a tech transfer process. So we're not actually working for the technology transfer office, although within our contract, uh, our folks do support that. But there's ways we can also help facilitate um, NASA-based technologies out into the, you know, the, the industry to either launch new companies or have applications for non-space non applications as well. But along those lines, in terms of the connections and partnerships, uh, you know, we'll engage different universities and, uh, and sponsor capstone projects. We're working one now with Texas A&M. And then certainly, we'll, we'll be involved in the different um, industry conferences and workshops that are going on. And then, you know, particularly in terms of partnerships, in terms of how we try to help go to the space industry and support uh, this emerging commercial space ecosystem, we're always looking at ways as there are opportunities for collaborations and partnerships. 
um, we're doing an activity called opportunity mapping. Where we're trying to see all the different organizations and activities that are out in the ecosystem, seeing what they're doing, how these different organizations' activities may be related or interfacing to each other, and so we can help support that in terms of what we're trying to achieve. So more recently, we've been talking you know, with Space Center in Houston because they have um, a lot of plans and that, that look like they have some alignment of what we're doing. So certainly there looks to be potentially a partnership opportunity there. And then the third thing is in entrepreneurship. Um, so you know, NASA and JSC very much are looking to support the entrepreneurial community, uh, community. So we're finding ways to see if we can help attract and retain entrepreneurship in commercial space. Um, in terms of how do we reduce that environment, the risk that's involved in that environment, whether it's you know, raising capital, um, the infrastructure, you know, trying to see customers, right? Everyone knows that starting a new company is a very risky endeavor, so what, would, what can we do to help? One of the things that we are looking at more near term is that here, right at Rice University, we're in the process of sponsoring um, a prize at their business plan competition, which if you know, many of you know is the richest and largest in the world. Um, so we'll be looking to be awarding a prize for a company that has applications that benefit our contract and therefore benefit NASA as well. And then um, we're also looking again more partnership opportunities with different startup development organizations. So what we are not is, um, is one of those. We're not an accelerator. We're not an incubator. That's not in our wheelhouse. But given what I've talked about in some of our capabilities and the things that we do, we think we can certainly help some startups that are technology-based in space in terms of things like TRL development, technology readiness level. Um, so we can partner with a startup development organization and maybe we can contribute some of our folks' time to help with that aspect. Then there'll be good partner opportunities there. And so we're calling that our partner development program, our PDP. And of course, we want to be engaged with going on in the community in the startup world. Um, so you'll see us at, at different events, whether it's at the ION, um, we certainly participate at, with uh, you know, JSC's uh, tech talks that Monty puts on. And then we also, of course, try to get, engage different small businesses and startups as well when those opportunities uh, come around. So when you look at this, um, you know, this is just a very high level picture. And I mentioned we're working on what's called opportunity mapping, where we're trying to capture many of the different activities going on. But if you look at kind of what this space ecosystem is, where you've got the ION that's just up the street, um, it's sort of an innovation hub of hubs, and then you go down the I-45 corridor, you've got the Houston Space Fort, you know, where Axiom and Intuitive Machines is, is setting up space there. Um, you can look at that as sort of a manufacturing and production hub there for aerospace, and certainly a little bit further down. You've got the Johnson Space Center, um, and then Space Center in Houston is right across the street from there. So this is just a very high level, but we're trying to see how can we grow this, right? And how can we make sure that we're building community and people are working together for the benefit of all, right? Um, certainly left out some, some different organizations here. I mean, you know, Exploration Park is what's going on. So that is the AFP, the, the, um, the proposal that's been put out by the Johnson Space Center. They're making some land available for external partner or external organization to come and develop it and find ways to help uh, with this growing of the making commercial space more available. Um, so that is going through its process right now. Um, hopefully we'll hear something soon um, you know, coming up. And then other startup development organizations like the Canon and what we mentioned earlier, and certainly we, you know, Rice University is a part of that as well. So this is what the, we're, we're, you know, we're trying to kind of put together and kind of grow and see how we can all you know, get everyone to benefit from. So in terms of the, the office that, that we have at a CPTIO, I mentioned it or alluded to it very briefly about our partner development program. And this is some of the things that we've been trying to let the community know. We've been doing this uh, CPTIO roadshow, um, particularly talking about this partner development program. So we can offer services to space related startups or small businesses, like I said before, in terms of like TRL development. And a part of that, we could also provide some venture development uh, support as well. And then, um, because of the work we do on the, on the JETS contract, we can help potentially facilitate connections and introductions to JSE resources. You know, we think there's a good fit and, and you know, it would be beneficial to NASA's missions and programs. And what's great about this is that it's provided at no cost to those, um, to those small entrepreneurs or business. They just have to meet the criteria that we've aligned here in terms of, again, benefiting our contract and therefore 
benefits NASA. So does it have an application that advances NASA missions or aligns with the different JSC focus areas? Or even if it's not particularly for um, a specific space application, but if it's maybe a technology or a new business that is spawned out of NASA licensed intellectual property. So that's the tech transfer part. Um, that's also within scope. And then we, we also like to see if, you know, if there's products or services that basically support a low um, Earth orbit or lunar economy. Um, so again, it's at no cost. There's no catch. We're not looking to take any equity or anything like that. So you're probably wondering why are we doing it? Um, so part of it is right, you know, this is part of what we've been asked to do, to do from JSC and we're very, very happy to do so. But it's very much in the line that you know, a rising tide lifts all, you know, if this is good for the community, we're going to benefit too. We want to grow the pie. And so everyone um, benefits from doing this. You know, there's some administrative things that, you know, we've come across an opportunity. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll talk and figure out what type of scope is going to make sense to support. Um, but, you know, we'll formally agree that through, through an MOA. And then, of course, you know, we've got a lot of things going on. We're going to do our best to help, but it's going to be subject to, you know, the timelines of, you know, the startup's needs and the available resources we have. But we very much want to be able to help, um, you know, these small companies and businesses in terms of in terms of these areas. Um, a couple of links here. Um, I like the, the the link we have for our Jet Studio contracts called We Have Space for You.com. Hopefully, it's easy to remember, and certainly references to uh, NASA's websites. If you haven't seen it lately, they have recently revamped their website. I think it looks uh, really good. Um, so some information on NASA's missions and then some of the JC capabilities are also are also provided here. So that's what we, we wanted to do. Like I said, this is um, sort of a roadshow of what we've been going through to different organizations. Um, so one of the things maybe as an ask is that if you've got other organizations in your network that you think may benefit from this, um, we'd like to talk to them, um, whether what those organizations or focus initiatives are, maybe challenges, see if there's potential collaboration opportunities. Um, so like I said, we're just trying to get the word out there. We want to make people avail, aware of the resource that we're providing. And hopefully, you know, we can achieve the things that we want in terms of, you know, growing the space ecosystem and, you know, making Houston, you know, what it always has been, you know, hub of human space flight. But we make sure we maintain that and help make Texas be a leader in space as well. So that's what I, what we have all here today. Um, I think we're happy to, to take any questions, um, either from myself or, or Wobi. But thank you for your time. Really information packed and uh, I, I, you know very fascinating, uh, well concatenated story. So uh, uh, thank you so much for, for the talk, and, and I know it stimulated some some questions. Uh, so first of all, we're going to take questions from the audience if you have any. All right, so I have a question, you know, so let's just say I'm, I have this great idea and, and uh, I have this researcher out at, at a rice that's, that's really come up with this great innovation that I think you guys, uh, well, it fits in kind of in the NASA gaps and the, and the sustainability strategy. Uh, so I, I've uh, sort of, talked it over with the lab and they said, yeah, you know, we, we might be interested in doing something. So what are the kind of the next steps if, if I actually want to do this? Yeah, so one of the things is that we're very happy to, to engage with them, to discuss and um, see what we can do to help. Because again, one of the things we can do is then we can, you know, make our, um, take our look at it and then know who to see or is the best fit in terms of the NASA side or the JSC side, you know, to then make those connections as where it's possible. Um, so the idea is we, we sort of do a white paper or do we do a pitch or we just have a phone call or? Yeah, so I think yes. that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, so I think that the, the, the best thing to do would be to um, organize the, whatever it is that the folks want to present to organize it in a sort of a, a summary. They don't have to do a full pitch deck or what have you, but just sort of organize their thoughts. Enough to where they can come and have a, a intelligent conversation about what it is they want to do, what it is they have, what they don't have, what they think they need. Um, what we should do is actually give your email address and yeah. say, and say uh, get in touch with Tim, and then we'll arrange to have a conversation about it. 
Call Tim. <laughs> Call Tim. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> I have a question regarding the, uh, the support you provide. You talk, you say that the support, you provide support to startup and so on. What about the startup? Are they only national or also international? Yeah, th th that's a good point. Um, we are we are focusing more locally, um, so regionally in Houston or Texas in general. Um, that's that's where we're focusing. Are we had to scope it somewhat, but you know we're we're very interested in growing the local commercial space economy here in Houston and making Texas a leader. So I would say Texas. So if they have a local footprint, but they have uh, international reach back, that that's sort of meets your criteria, right? Yeah, they have a local presence. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody? What are some of the challenges you see for this next phase of growing the Houston space economy? I think that the, the greatest challenge we have overall is cultural inertia. And so that's just getting past the idea that we deserve to be here. Just because we're we did we were we were you know we were we space city of course this is all that all remember that whole chart that I had about all the great things that we did the great things that we did do not necessarily mean that this is the path that we're going to build our future on so there are other places that haven't had that provenance who've been killing it because they've been working hard to show that they mean they earn it they deserve a place at the table. I think that that's now shifting and changing finally. And we are taking this sort of point of view. I mean, the, again, the legislature even coming in with, all right, we will actually put some money into that and not just assume that just because we don't have state income taxes and it's a business friendly environment, everybody thinks that they're going to be here. No, you do have to put some deliberate and intentional effort into attracting those people and into creating the right community and culture. So that's the second part the creation of community and so because we're a mature ecosystem as a mature ecosystem we have tend to silo into verticals that tend to have more competitive point of view but at the beginning especially at the, at the nascent stages and i would say this for commercial airspace we do need to have more of a community-centric cooperative and collaborative point of view so um i think those are where our challenges are but i definitely see opportunities Okay, so Eliza's got a question. Yeah, we got a couple of questions on uh, the Zoom. So the first one we got is from Sarah. Uh, we have a small aerospace and space ecosystem in Austin. How can Austin companies be included in the ecosystem, or are we focused on competing with each other and slowing down economic development in our state? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, what that's what's called a leading question. So, <laughs> so, so, so as, as Tim said, the emphasis of the CPTIO in support of JSC is supporting that which JSC supports. So JSC support area actually extends beyond Texas even. We are, we've made the focus at first just to have a, a focus, uh, Houston, but we are certainly open to and connected to what's happening in Austin. So if you have something in Austin that might, an opportunity in Austin that might uh, need our help, Sarah, uh, please feel free to reach out. We are more than happy to have a conversation. Perfect. Uh, I got a request if you could stand a little bit closer to Tim. Yeah. Oh, to heat oh. For, the, for the mic? <laughs> okay. Why don't you take that off and we'll just pass it back. Okay, next question. Um, what are the best ways to get Someone asked, who are the tier four companies? Tier four? Mm -hmm. So so currently tier four I, here in Houston, um, I would put tier four as Intuitive Machines, uh, Axiom, NanoRacks, another example of tier four, but outside of Houston would be Firefly. I would also put a tier four. Um, I, uh, for now, I think I would probably say that those are where tier four would be. There's, there's another one, Firehawk, they're in Dallas, uh, but I would say they're probably more like tier three. But these, these would be the ones, again, with material traction um, and uh, a good chance of achieving escape velocity. Okay, thank you. And then we have one more question. Um, is CPTIO going to hire mentors, entrepreneur, and residents? No. 
Um, no. Um, again, our what we are looking to do is we're looking to partner with others who do that. So there might be a startup development organization who has mentors. Um, now, there's a small degree to which we might do that. For example, I might engage in that myself if it seems appropriate. But on the large part, we're looking to be more of an orchestrator and facilitator and, and pulling things together that go and deliver these services rather than seeing us as, again, a startup development organization that would have a mentorship core. OK, so um, we uh, are, are Two speakers will stay here for um, maybe five, ten minutes uh, if you guys want to come up and have a chat with them. And uh, thank you all for attending tonight. I uh, you know the rain was uh, was a uh, definitely a challenge to try to get through in the traffic, the commensurate traffic when surprisingly Houston gets rain. You know, it's, it's, it seems like we could, we could manage that, but no. Uh, it's because the the traffic system's already stressed, and any little extraneous stress makes it make it even worse. Uh, so anyway, that's a different topic for a different discussion. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for coming. And uh, with that, we're going to conclude uh, the Zoom part. And uh, we'll have a, a short Q&A uh, if you guys want to come up and uh, have any further discussion with our speakers. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.